Thank you for joining us again and welcome back to our channel. If you are joining us for the first time, we want to thank you for watching. In today's episode, I will be diving into the reason why the United States of America and its allies still fail to diagnose the strategic relationship that Russia has in the continent of Africa, including China. We do have an analyst that's going to be helping us with regards to breaking it down as to the reason why Washington still don't understand how to figure out the geopolitical strategic issues in the continent of Africa. So without any more delay, let's just dive straight into it. Some global experts will argue that the United States has lost focus in the continent of Africa. A lot of narratives with regards to Russia and China has clouded the American perspective in the region. Most experts still argue that the US has not lost it all. However, this is how I see it as an analyst. The United States recognizes Africa's strategic significance, but its influence on the continent of Africa may be compromised as a result of the constant discussion with regards to Russia and China. What the continent of African people do not hear from the United States is why the United States offer an alternative and what the U.S. is doing on the ground. But my observation has been that our, that our policy focus in Africa quite often has been been too narrowly focused mm -hmm. and too short-term focused uh, and other than the things that have been mentioned AGOA, PEPFAR, quite often focused on the wrong things. Uh, before the end of the Cold War our main focus was competition with the Soviet Union and we are again now looking at competition with China with and with Russia. And the, Russians. Uh, the problem with that is it it narrows our view to, to a certain menu of things, uh, some of which don't often benefit the people of the countries of Africa, and in fact some that often work to their detriment. But, but one of the things that it does do, and this is the experience or my observation in talking to many of my African colleagues in the countries that I visited or worked in, is that by, fo by having our focus on competition with an external power rather than, uh, than focusing on the countries themselves, mm. we insult and anger not the, just the governments but the people because in a way they see this as, as minim minimizing or marginalizing them. We, they are seen as pawns in this, this game between the two big players and, and was the African saying when the elephants fight, the grass gets trampled. trampled. Well, I think some of these, <laughs> in some of these countries, people feel like grass. We, we, so I, this is just my perspective. We need to, I think, we need to continue to do those humanitarian things that lift people out of misery and poverty. But we also need to have a broader, more long-term focus on dealing with Africa. Ambassador Davis said it. That, that, or, or, or your colleague, uh, in a few decades, 25% of the world's youth and working population will be on the African continent. If we don't provide opportunities for those people, that's a huge pool of potential recruits for extremist views and extremist organizations, which affects our national security quite directly. It also inhibits and impedes the development of the continent. So we need to join with governments and with the people in Africa to take a longer term view of how can the countries of Africa develop, take more responsibility for themselves, provide more for their people. And, and oh, by the way, I mean, one of the things, and maybe this is because I'm not an Africa hand, I, I, I try not to talk about Africa unless I'm talking about the continent, and I always qualify it by saying the countries of Africa. And I've lost count of the number of languages and ethnic groups. I, I, this is a thing I think we also need to do is to start looking at Africa for the diverse demographic, geographic, ethno-linguistic system that it is and not thinking of it as as this single 
large entity called Africa because no such thing exists. The U.S. has not been able to sell its achievement in the continent of Africa. If you listen to geopolitical analysts, Russia speak less, China speak less, they carry out action, but the United States of America is everywhere, all over the place, talking about a geopolitical force that African countries are beginning to make their own decision. If you listen to this particular video we are about to play on why an American policy advisor will concentrate on Russia, what the Americans should be doing in Africa to uh, show the African people that they are more important and more better in terms of their operations and engagement in a lot of areas than the Russians or Chinese, and more importantly talking about the negativity with regards to Russia's presence in the continent. The policymakers also fail to understand the historical relationship relationship that Russia and Africa does have. This goes back a long time ago when this particular aspect if you consider the southern part of Africa they consider the relationship with Russia very special. I think it's no surprise why Africans have been voting in a different way at the United Nations Security Council. Let's just dive into this expert on perspective and we will get back into the video to look at the basics on why the United States of America and its policymakers don't get it at all. Yeah, there's a lot to talk about uh, with regards to Russia and Africa and as Sani mentioned there's a lot going on. I think I would start and perhaps if there's one thing you're going to uh, remember from what I say is that Russia provides less than one percent of the foreign direct investment that goes into Africa. Um, moreover, you know, the amount of trade that Russia provides and, and has with Africa is modest, about $14 billion, and it's been in decline. At the 2019 uh, Russia-Africa summit, Vladimir Putin said that Russia would be doubling the amount of trade that it has with uh, Africa. At that time, it was about $20 billion, and the idea was to get up to $40 billion five years by 2024. Instead, it's declined. Likewise, Russia's GDP has been in decline you know, pretty steadily since 2013. It was about $2.2 trillion then. It's about $1.8 trillion today. So the point is, uh, Russia is not gaining influence. It is not uh, offering an attractive uh, partnership with Africa through its conventional uh, means, through trade and economic development. Um, Rather, you know, Russia is gaining influence through irregular means. And these irregular means are often uh, uh, illegal and they're, and they're low cost, they're asymmetric. So this includes, I mean, this is focused on uh, an elite capture model, trying to come into support of beleaguered, isolated regimes who don't have a lot of uh, international supporters and helping to keep them in power. You know, and they do this through these irregular tools like uh, through the deployment of the Wagner paramilitary, disinformation, electoral interference, um, and uh, opaque arms for resources deals, and, uh, and you know, pr blocking different UN or other international sanctions against these regimes for human rights abuses or uh, or, or blocking democratic development uh, in these countries. And so again, let's let's just hold it there. From what you've heard, that's the simple narrative that has been in the mainstream media. It, it is as if countries in the Sahel or most African nations, like we've pointed out, cannot make a decision on their own. It's as if Mali cannot decide that it wants to charter a new part in their own future. It's as if Mali cannot make a decision who they want to partner with. It's as if Niger cannot decide which country they want to work with. Niger have decided that they don't want to work with France and they also want the United States of America to leave the country. They have decided they can work with everybody. They can work with the European Union, work with Russia and work with also China and even the United States of America itself by just carving out a narrative and pointing out that Russia just support those regimes. We all know the history very well. A lot of Western uh, 
state systems have also supported a number of dictators over the years which has complicated the africans development in several ways from natural resources and also replacing coups and military regimes so i think this narrative of just highlighting that russia is basically um just in the continent to disrupt things and for its own interest it goes back to the failed policy that we are seeing happening and what we've seen how france is facing a lot of challenges because they've decided not to engage the african continent as equal partners so this is the basic problem i believe that united states policy advisors should be telling the united states government that the african government and people want to take full control of their future and they want honest partnership they want to deal with people who can see them as equal and that's the alternative that china is offering and also um russia is offering to an extent but can it compete with china which wields huge influence across africa the united states wants to strengthen our partnerships across africa in ways that serve your interests our interests and the interests of people worldwide whose lives and futures depend in part on what we can achieve together the united states knows that on most of the urgent challenges and opportunities we face africa will make the difference we can't achieve our goals around the world whether that's ending the covid 19 pandemic building a strong and inclusive global economy combating the climate crisis or revitalizing democracy and defending human rights without the leadership of African governments, institutions, and citizens. In the North share, Africa's strategic importance is set to increase. The United States of America's aim to counter China and Russia influence will backfire. African countries will likely engage with all sides. As Cold War trends emerges, Africa has become a key stage for strategic competition between actors with varying and also sometimes irreconcilable interests. The geopolitical relevance of the continent of Africa is set to increase dramatically. Its population is booming and its mineral resources will be in high demand for the green energy transition. More importantly, the African bloc looks poised to play a determining role in multilateral institutions as all of we've seen with regards to Russia's vote in the United Nations General Assembly. However, the political landscape has significantly changed since the second half of the 20th century. African countries are now better equipped to reap the benefits of systemic competition in the continent of Africa and around the world. The second is countries are starved of capital, right? And in most African countries, their biggest challenge is financing, okay? And if you're starved of capital, uh, what you want strategically in your foreign policy is to give yourselves as many options as possible. You want a variety of partnerships, okay? So it's not, so it's not necessarily like, okay, what are they offering? It's, I don't want to box myself into one corner. And mind you, my most important trading relationship is China. And China has a strategically close relationship with Russia. The friend of my friend is my friend, or at least the friend of my friend is not my enemy, right? So you want to keep, keep those doors open and keep yourself um, flexible. Um, now, the other thing that I would say that I think often gets lost in the conversation when we talk about, you know, whether and how Russia's actions in Africa are destabilizing. I think the tendency in the U.S. and from the U.S. audience is to say, you know, and this has been happening a lot with China, let me explain to you why this is bad. Let me explain to you why you should not associate with X, Y, Z, okay? The, these, the, the, the trading, you know, trading relationship, partnerships, whatever it is, like, they're not, they're not hiring Wagner or going to the Africa summit because they don't understand the risks, right? They're grown adults. They know exactly what they're doing. They don't, you know, but they're doing it in, and, and in part, even where there are negative effects, like with Wagner, it's because of the lack of institutional capacity. It's because of the lack of state capacity. It's because of the, the, the state of, you know, strength of political institutions and so i often say what i want i mean, what i want you as policy to do is to focus on how do we strengthen those things 
so that we don't have the incentives to do it. Not to say don't do it, because what's the point of you telling me don't do it? I know what's, it's bad. I'm doing it because I can get away with it, right? Um, and also think about how, like, you know, we, from an African perspective, we know, you know, there's so many non-Russian Western firms that do the same things. Glencore, if you just Google Glencore in DRC, right? Glencore in DRC, you know, paid lots of bribes, lots of shady market deals to do lots of stuff that was not in, in DRC's interest. Like, the difference is that Glencore comes from a country, a state, where it's more likely to be held accountable for those things, right? Wagner doesn't, but will any other company in any other Western state do the same things if they could get away with it? Yes, and they have. The French in West Africa do the same thing, sorry, all the time. We, you know, if it's very controversial, the French in West Africa, very corrupt, murky deals state to state. Again, the risk appetite is a little bit higher in France versus the US. You're more likely to get, you know, shamed in the US. So the, the point I'm making is humans, human nature and the Latin greed and all of that is the same. What we need to do is focus on how do we strengthen those political institutions. I think that often comes from improving the ability to raise revenue, improving financing, improving capital, investing in the things that make economies competitive, right? Not necessarily just the trade, not necessarily the like human rights, democracy, da da da, but also like financing the bridge, financing the you know those things that would then help improve capacity. So that's one of that's sort of my little um, advice, I guess, on U.S. foreign policy, and I'll stop there, stop there, and we can. If you look at the United States of America strategy for Africa, Africa has never been a priority for the American policymakers. While the Biden administration is no exception, the United States of America's 2020 strategy towards Sub-Saharan Africa clearly recognizes the relevance of the continent within the current fragmented world order. The document highlighted three important figures. Africa will account for 15% of the world's population by 2050. It holds 30% of the world's reserves of critical minerals and it makes up 28% of the United Nations voting groups. But the rationale for the United States of America's engagement in the region is also based on the need to counteract expanding influence of other actors, namely China and also uh, Russia. If you look at different strategic options, in recent decades, the United States of America's policy for Africa has been determined and also mostly by security concern. Washington has maintained a strong security footprint on the continent of Africa, including a permanent military base in Djibouti. It also has several military facilities in East Africa, with Africa and also the Sahel region, where it plays a critical and I bet discrete role in surveillance in the region. When compared with other actors like the European Union or China, the United States of America approach has been characterized by trade and investment rather than development, assistance or loan. Instead of broad agendas, Washington relies on specific programs like the 2000 African Growth and Opportunity Act, also the 2003 President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, and the 2013 Power African Initiatives, or more recently Prosper African Initiative designed by the Trump administration. The new security reaffirms declaration from 2017 when national security strategy named China and Russia as actor, attempting to erode American security and prosperity. The document states that U.S. rivalry are employing non-military tools to advance their influence and also interests on the continent of Africa. Let's listen to what these analysts have to say and we will close the videos in the next few minutes. A lot of observers say the U.S. is in the business of promoting dictatorship on the African continent. How, do, how does really an average American taxpayer benefit out of that? Well, I, I don't really know that I can say or that I would agree that we are promoting dictatorship on the continent. Uh, in fact, what I, what I think my observation, uh, and this is from, from uh, a, a remove since I've been out of government since 2012, is that we're really not it's not so much that we are promoting dictatorships as it is 
our focus on competing with China, and the Chinese take a very, um, how should you put it, shortcut approach to working with a country that instead of working with the people, they they're find the pragmatic. strongest. They're very pragmatic. They, they work with the dictators. And right. so because our focus tends to be on competing with them, there, there's, this, there's this image that we are promoting dictatorship. I think the problem is what we are, it's not so much what we are doing as what we are not doing. We are not putting a strong enough emphasis on promoting rule of law, on promoting participatory government and inclusion. Uh, and 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 we 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 are. I I, I sense that we have this. You're with us, or you're with them, <laughs> approach, mm. uh, which which again it tends to create this image that, quite frankly, I don't think is is accurate. I don't think it's so much that we we're promoting dictators as we seem to be saying to those people who are cozying up to the Chinese, mm. you join us or. You know, we're going to cut you off at the knees. And um, the, the unfortunate thing there is if the Chinese are, have, have good relations with the dictator and we're focusing on trying to disrupt that relationship, mm -hmm. we're also sending a very negative message to the non-dictators. I mean, it's, 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 it's when you act, you have to remember that that your your intended audience is not the only audience that sees your actions. They're not the only audience that hear mm. hears your words. So so I, I I would I would disagree that we're promoting dictatorships. Really? I think I don't think we're promoting dictatorships. I think what we're doing is mm. we are we're 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 creating conditions where dictatorships are thriving and it's not an and I don't think it's an intended consequence our our, our intent is to try and delink them from China mm. but we don't have the okay if we should happen to get them to dissolve their relationship with China what next I see I'll give you an example in the 1980s for example um, you did have uh, US foreign policy supporting a one Mobutu Sese Seko was a banger yes. in the Congo. Oh, yeah. You, talk you in the also 19th. had uh, Esiad Bale, for yes. example, in yeah. Somalia. And as a matter of fact, I remember a man called Paul Manafort. Paul Manafort was confronted because he had actually been lobbying on behalf of some of those yes. dictators. And he said, yes, he may be bad. But he he's our bad. Be, yeah, a dictator, but he's our own bad dictator. Yeah. No, I, what has I, changed, really? Well, okay, first of all, we, we, have to, we have to consider that we're talking two, com, two different eras. That was the era the of the U.S.-Soviet Cold War, which mm -hmm. was a sort of a socio-political mm -hmm. confrontation. What we're, what we're in now, a, a friend of mine um, at an army base in Georgia and I were going back and forth and he came up with the term Cold War II mm -hmm. and I jokingly said it's more like Cold War 2.0 because <laughs> of the cyber <laughs> dimension. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what we have now is a, what I think is the beginnings of another Cold War, only it's not a bipolar, mm -hmm. it's more of multi. us against, it's a multipolar and we're you have the China. Russians and the Chinese yes. as the two main players and us. And it has as much of a, an economic dimension. Mm -hmm. And then there's, of course, the sort of cyber dimension, social media and the like. Mm -hmm. And we seem to be ill-equipped mm. to fight in this war. This is one cold war where we're going in with one hand tied behind our back and, uh -huh. and the other and the hand over our eyes. Right. So. So it's creating this impression that, I mean, I, like I said, it's, it maybe in some people's minds it's creating the impression that we are supporting dictators. When, when in fact, I don't see that we're supporting anyone. I mean, we don't have a we're for this. It's we're against the Chinese having primacy. We're against the Russians coming in here. So, you know, ignore them. Come with us. But, but why not promote the values I which have could no in fact translate no, 
you'd have to ask into long-term peace and stability because we don't have a long-term vision of what we want to see on the African continent competition with the Chinese is not a long-term strategy that's mm. a short-term we win they lose <laughs> long-term is we win, they lose, now we've won, Let's, how are we going to rebuild this? We don't have that part of it. The values win democracy, for example. Because we haven't thought that far in advance. We're focusing now on how do we defeat the Chinese. During the Cold War, the United States sincerely was promoting democracy very aggressively in Europe. Yes. Behind the curtains. Yes. Why not Africa? Good question. I think we should. And, and I, think, I think on the ground, many of our ambassadors and our diplomats who work there do, in fact, promote it. Whether it's a long-term national policy or strategy is a good question. And, and as I said, since my personal observation is we do not have nor have we ever had a long-term strategy or vision for Africa and the countries of Africa, then without that long-term vision, of course, it's not there. You know, we, we, we have not, our, our focus in Africa, even during the Cold War, okay? I mean, mm -hmm. even dur yes, we promoted democracy aggressively during the Cold War. But it was really more so about... It was to uh, defeat the Soviets. ...and extracting resources. Well, that too. And, and, but, but I mean, the primary focus was to win against the Soviet Union. And when the Soviet Union had to pack its bags, pick up its ball and leave the field, what happened to all those programs? I see. We want to thank you for watching. If you are new to this channel, we encourage you to subscribe. Check some of our informative videos on our YouTube channel to broaden your geopolitical knowledge in regards to how Africa interacts with the global community. For now, we want to thank you for watching. We are looking forward to meeting you soon in our next episode. Have a good day. Bye-bye.